and cannot obtain. You fight and wait, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask amiss, and that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scriptures say in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from, me, from you. And draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. So my kind of main title here today is saying double-minded Christians. Do I just press it? Yeah. Yeah. This one here. Yeah. No, no, that's right. <laughs> oh, there you go. I don't even know how to work it. <laughs> that's really fancy, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> so this year, my main studies have been in the book of James. And as some of you kind of know that I've been given the vision Friday night and devotionals a few times sharing what I have gleaned from these chapters and verses in the book of James. So a little background is that what we know about James. Well, there are a few Jameses in the New Testament, but this epistle was written by James, the brother of Jesus. And it was approximately 45 to 50 AD during the very early days of the church, Christian church. And James, in writing to the Jewish Christians who have spread out from Jerusalem, they spread out from Jerusalem, this was through persecution, through the martyrdom of um, Stephen. And this is how through that they had um, scattered throughout the whole um, Roman Empire. So earlier in John chapter 7 verses 3 to 5, we read that Jesus' brothers disbelieve who he is. And this is approximately six months before his crucifixion. So they have witnessed firsthand or heard about many of the miracles of Jesus, but they still don't believe his claim to be the Messiah. And that it's only after the resurrection, when Jesus appeared to his brothers, James and his disciples in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 verse 7, it's that, G that, it's that James, when he was converted, being listed among the 120 that were gathered in the upper room of Pentecost, and by Galatians chapter 2 verse 9, James was the leader of the Jerusalem church. He was the pillar of the church. And this was quite a turnaround and the evidence was of the miraculous nature of the resurrection. He came from skeptic and mocker to leader and in a time he became a martyr. And James shows that what it means what it means to live out our faith in the fullness of Christ. So today I want to, as we look at James chapter 4 verses 1 to, 10, 1 to 10, James pulls no punches in these verses. Up until now, this point, 
he has written to his beloved brethren. And as we will soon see, his tone changes. And he is a, has a very direct approach in his rebuke to the early church members. His intention isn't to be harsh, but it's rather to encourage. To encourage these believers to live out their faith with wisdom so that they could be effective for Christ. So while this letter was written to the early, to the early believers, the instruction and encouragement is just as relevant for us today. James is concerned that worldly wisdom, which isn't wisdom at all, has infiltrated the church. And we certainly see this in many churches today. In James chapter 1, verse 8, James warns against being double-minded, being a double-minded man or lady. He warns that this will lead to instability and unbelief that will cause division and ungodly behaviour. And in chapter 3, James has been contrasting earthly and heavenly wisdom. And as we come to chapter 4, we see the impact of worldly wisdom on these scattered churches where the members are striving with contentions against one another. So, with these Jewish Christians, their carnal folly led to violent disputes. And the church just has, the church today can just as easily fall into these kind of errors. So let's look how we can maintain unity through godly wisdom. I want to look at verses 1 and 2, the cause of conflicts amongst the double-minded Christians. Our second point will be verses 3 to 6, the consequences of a, of a, the consequences for double-minded Christians. And point 3 will, from verses 7 to 10 will be the cure for double-minded Christians. So, our first point, verses 1 to 2, the cause of conflicts amongst double-minded Christians. James comes straight to the point in verse 1. He says here, Where do wars and fights come from among you? This is a, a messed up church. And we read twice of fights. The church members are brawling and were dwelling together in unity. And godly wisdom has been left out on the doorstep. And I wonder, have you ever known someone that will, that, that will make everything into an argument? Or have you been that person that makes everything into an argument? Well, that, that's what these members are like. James doesn't specially mention the things they are arguing about, but he knows that the topics they are, talk, that they are arguing over aren't the root cause of their problem. The root cause is that they are carnally minded and no longer seeking the heart of God. And James continues, Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? These members were battling together because of their desires for pleasures battling within themselves. Desires for pleasure from the Greek meaning hedon, which is the pursuit of sensual self-indulgence. 
In secular philosophy, it is the ethical theory that pleasure, in the sense that satisfaction of desires, is the highest good and proper aim of human life. No wonder the world is in such a mess with this kind of thinking amongst secular philosophers of today. They are being pumped out as moral or, or objective truth. You don't need to be especially a clever person to, to see how disastrous this type of thinking is affecting our world. James is warning. James is warning these church members that their selfish desires are causing some serious problems. While they profess to, with their mouths to be followers of Christ, their actions tell different, they tell a different story. But James goes boldly on, you lust, he says here in James, you lust and you do not have, you murder and covet, and cannot obtain, you fight and war. James is referencing the words of Jesus in Matthew 5 verses 21 to 22 in the Sermon of the Mount. When he warns the, he warns the people that to have hate towards their brother is committing murder in their heart. And these words, lust, murder and covet, are the hard-hitting words recognisable to the Jewish Christians who would be very, very familiar with the Old Testament, with the Ten Commandments, where all these listed as shall not. And his aim here is to really drive home how serious this situation is and the cause of conflict amongst these early believers is that they have lost their sight of their first love. They have lost the vision of, heavenly king, of the heavenly kingdom and they are looking down instead of up. So let's look at our second point. The consequences of double-minded, the consequences for double-minded Christians. The last part of verse 2 to verse 3 Reads, Yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Here we see the results of their double minded behavior. Their prayer life is ineffective, it was ineffective because their prayers were selfishly motivated. The purpose of prayer isn't to get whatever we want. God is not that kind of genie in the bottle ready to grant you three wishes because let's be real, if we had three wishes, one of them would certainly be to have endless Wishes fulfilled. That be my that's right. <laughs> but we would never be truly, truly satisfied because the, the purpose of prayer, the purpose of prayer is to align ourselves, align ourselves with the will of God so that our desires become the desires of the Lord to achieve his purpose and for his glory. Imagine praying to win the lottery. You pray, Lord, help me win millions and millions of pounds. And if I win, I will share it with the church. Will you really? Or will you just give this a mediocre kind of offering? while enjoying the rest of your spoils yourself. 
In Jeremiah warns, the heart is deceitfully above all things, desperately sick, who can understand it? God was hearing the prayers of the self-centered Christians who James was addressing and was giving them a big fat no. Their desires didn't align with the will of God and their double-mindedness was causing them to battle and quarrel with other members in the church. The cause for their conflict is that their inability to shed the desire for things of the world and to live all out for Christ's kingdom, they were straddling the fence instead of being in full submission to the Lord. Look down here, listen here in verse 4. James gets bolder in his rebuke. Ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God, whoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. This is a significant change in the tone as in previous chapters. He has used the phrase, my brethren and my beloved brethren. And now they are adulterers and adulteresses. Just like when God saw Israel's unfaithfulness and idol worship as a form of adultery, in the, like in the book of Isaiah and throughout the Old Testament scriptures, this behaviour among the Jewish Christians was spiritual adultery. They were being double-minded. They were being unfaithful to God, to the God of their salvation. They were living what was impossible, what was impossible to do, being a friend of the world and a friend of God. And it is impossible, it's, and it is impossible as James says, Whoever, therefore, wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. And to illustrate this, consider how adultery affects a marriage today. If you are committing adultery, it brings about a double-minded attitude, showing lack of love, commitment, and loyalty towards your partner. You're married on paper, but your actions have broken the vows that you have made. In a way, you hate your partner. You don't want to be with them. You're living two lives, two timing. Your behaviour of unfaithfulness makes you an enemy of your spouse. And if you are living for worldly pleasure, and you're an enemy of God. And James is giving us a, us a warning. If we are more focused on the world than on God, and if our desires are first and foremost on worldly things, it is like a, a broken marriage, unfaithful, through adultery. Let's look at verse 5. Or do you think that the scriptures says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously. God wants you to stop your double-mindedness, adultery. It provokes the Holy Spirit to yearn jealously. Imagine your husband or your wife, the love of your life, looking with, the, looking with desire at someone else. Would that, how, would, how would that make you feel? You would yearn for them to return to you, to you, look at you in that way. And we would long for them to be wholeheartedly 
to come to us again. And this is how the Holy Spirit yearns for His people. Our unfaithfulness would grieve our spouse. How much more would us it grieve the Holy Spirit of God who has been poured out on believers to sanctify them and present them as holy before a living God. And he is jealous over our affections when we diminish the great, the great gift of, of, of grace and instead lust after the desire of things of the world more than the things of God. These verses have been pretty harsh to read and should provoke us to really examine ourselves and consider whether or not we have fallen into the traps of the world. And every day, every day we are kind of bombarded, bombarded through advertising and social media, social media with things that will make us happy and fulfilled. A bigger house, a nicer car, the latest iPhone, even a new partner that will be your soulmate. All these things are sold to us as must-have things. And if we want to live happily ever after, and yet despite the relatively comfortable lives we live in the UK, more and more people are suffering from unhappiness, unfulfillment and depression. But we are not to, we are not without hope. Let's look at verse six. But he gives more grace, therefore he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And here James is referencing Proverbs chapter three, verse thirty four, where God gives more grace to the humble. God's grace can God's grace can bypass the proud the proud person and reach the humble. God's grace can reach the deepest places. His grace is available to us if we admit to God that we can't break away from being proud or self focused. We need to ask for his help. God's grace is more powerful than the dominating powers of the flesh, the world, and the devil. God gives us a solution for being unfaithful, self-focused, and double-minded. And that is, that isn't the end of the road for us as believers. So let's look at our last point. Verses 7 to 10. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. So let's look at it. verses 7 to 10. The cure for double double minded Christians. In verses seven to ten, James sets out how we can be cured from a double minded worldly life. Let's look down at verse seven. It says here Submit yourselves therefore to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. This is a verse that I've often heard in kind of Christian circles where they miss the, the start of this verse and they just say, resist the devil and he will flee from you. But they miss the most important part. They miss the start of this verse and it is, submit you, yourself therefore to God. And this is past, this, this is the most, probably the most important um, verse of these ten verses, submit yourself and 
there are two very important words and submission is the key. We can't resist the devil on our own because the desires of the flesh are strong, just like Eve in the garden of, of, in the Garden of Eden. We are inclined to listen to the lies and to the whispers in our ear from the devil. The devil is clever. He mixes a little truth with a big lie and we can easily be tricked if we aren't living life submitted fully to God. And Peter makes this point in 1 Peter verses 5, 1 Peter chapter 5 verse 9, he says here, resist him, the devil, be steadfast in the faith, knowing that the, the same suffering, suffering is experienced by your brotherhood in the world. Submit and be steadfast, resolute, both feet planted in the word of God. Don't be swayed. The devil is having a field day with these double-minded believers in the book of James. So James has reminded them to submit to God wholeheartedly. And when they do, God's grace will be manifest in them. The same is true for us today. If we find ourselves fallen in sin, we have a way out. And that is to submit. And submission requires humility. We need to recognise our standing before a holy, a holy God and know that it is only by the grace we have been saved, not of ourselves, least any man should boast. In Ephesians 2 verses 89. So submit yourself. Here comes from from the Greek the word hypotso. It is, was a primary word used as a, a primary um, military term meaning to, to be under, to be under authority by someone who is senior. So for us it means to be under our commanding officer and that is Jesus Christ. In these verses, 7 to 10, they are 10 practical commands for professing believers and in the whole book of James there are a total of 54 clear commands to help the Christian lead a Christ-centered life. If we want to avoid double-mindedness, if we want to avoid double-mindedness, we need to be actively seeking to put these practical imperatives, commands into practice. And we've looked into the first two. Submit to God and resist the devil. But let's look at the next day quickly. It says here, draw near to God. We don't do these in our own strength. The first imperative, draw near to God, comes with a promise. If we will, and he will draw near to you. If we choose to be distant from the Lord, he won't force himself on us. We need a desire, a desire that closeness, and he promises he won't remain distant. So draw near through reading the word, through prayer, through fasting, through praise and worship. And clench your hands. Imagine washing your hands and doing some digging in the garden. The dirt is ingrained in your fingers, under your nails, and you need to scrub them clean, washing them until there is no longer any contamination. We need to cleanse ourselves by owning up to our sin by confessing it before the Lord and seeking his forgiveness. And it reads down here, P 
purify your heart through repentance, which is a, a complete turning away from sin. Don't play the hypocrite, asking the Lord's forgiveness with no intention of changing your ways. In Psalm 51, David asked the Lord to create in me a clean heart. And after his confession of sin with Bathsheba, he knows that true repentance leads to a purifying, a cleansing of the heart. And let's look at lament, mourn, and weep in verse 9. We consider these three together. They're all, they all denote a severe, severe sorrow, a deep sadness that grieves us to the point where our hearts are sore and where our bones ache and with the ways in which, it, in the way that, that we have disobeyed and dishonoured the Lord. And again, let's look at this. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. The word laughter here in the Greek refers to the, to the kind of the mocking to the rebellious laughter associated with worldly pleasures. It's laughter that scoffs in the face of the Lord. It made me think of the recent Pride Month parades which, with their obscene and grotesque kind of behaviours, all while they're laughing gleefully in their debauchery and sin. And we need to turn away from finding pleasure in things that are in direct rebellion. That are in direct rebellion to God. And lastly, humble yourself before the Lord. We touched on this earlier, but humble here means to make oneself low. We need to get on our knees before the Lord and acknowledge our position before Him. We need to recognize our position before a pure and holy God and give thanks to His love towards us that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. So as we finish, so let's look what we, at the cause, so we've looked at the costs for division amongst the body believers and that is the double-minded selfish, selfish ambitions of the flesh. We've looked at the consequences of being double-minded. Double that is the, the failure to see an answer to prayer and the lack of growth in our personal relationship with the Lord. And we've seen the cure for double-mindedness. We must submit to the will of God. Submission will more often not mean making... Uh, submission will more often and not mean making changes to our lives that are uncomfortable. But we, well, we are called to surrender things we love, the things that we enjoy, the things we desire, we might be tempted to say, surely not, but if in our eyes and our eyes are fixed on things of heaven, then things of the world lose their luster. And as we grow closer to the Lord, our desire for heavenly things will increase. So we cry out to the Lord, I want more of you and less of me, in the words of the song. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be, all of my ambitions, hopes and plans, 
I surrender these unto your hands, for it is only in your will that I am free. Jesus, all for Jesus, all I am and have and ever hope to be. Thank you.